Yeah, kia ora. So I'm Matt Gardner, or Matthew, some people call me. Um, I'm a engineer by training. I studied at the University of Canterbury almost 20 years ago um, and have been working in the field of water resources engineering ever since. I've developed a special uh, expertise in the area of river modelling um, and river engineering and I've got a special interest in gravel bed river systems and I've, I've worked on, on large rivers all around the country for, for the majority of regional councils and district councils in New Zealand. Right, so the Buller catchment is a really interesting catchment. It's a, it's a very large catchment uh, in the scheme of catchments in New Zealand. It's one of the largest catchments. Um, it actually covers two districts. It, um, it spans into the Tasman as well as the, the Buller. Uh, so the Buller catchment has um, the estimated largest um, flood flow in New Zealand history. Um, which occurred in the large flood of 1926 in Westport. So this was a huge flood, uh, much bigger than, estimated to be much bigger than the, the event which was in July 2021, and with an estimated flow of 12,700 cumics. In addition to having the largest flood in New Zealand history, we also have the largest gauged flood in New Zealand history. Uh, so that was the flood of July 2021. So that was almost 9,000 cumics. And just to put that in perspective, um, the scale of flows in the Buller catchment, what we call a 1% AEP or annual exceedance probability, or some people refer to as 100 year probability flood, um, is in the order of 9,500 cumics in the Buller River. And if we compare that to just a couple of other rivers in the Canterbury region, the Waimakariri River has a 100 year flood flow in the order of 4,000 or 4,155. Um, and the Rakaia River, um, which is a little bit bigger than the Waimak, is about 5,800. And so, so the Buller River is almost twice as large a flow um, as, as the Rakaia River. So Westport is exposed to quite a wide range of hazards. Um, so just to run through before we go into more detail of the specifics, we've got we've got a risk for river flooding as one of the main risks. So river flooding occurs when we get rainfall over the entire catchment, but we're also exposed to stormwater flooding. So stormwater flooding is a slightly different mechanism, although it's still rain coming from the sky. Stormwater flooding occurs when we have intense rainfall, often quite short periods of rainfall, directly over Westport urban area itself. Um, in addition to stormwater flooding, we've also got, ex we're, we're coastal town and so we're exposed to coastal flooding so that can come from storm surges, large waves set up and there's also um, significant risk for tsunami and the coastal flooding can come in from, from all sides and we recently experienced significant coastal flooding in Westport in 2018 during Cyclone Fahey. Being so close to the southern fault line, um, Westport is vulnerable to earthquakes, we've got a history of earthquakes here. We have the Murchison earthquake of 1929 as well as the Anangahua earthquake of 1968. So the Anangahua earthquake is, is recorded as having a significant landslide dam um, form in the upper catchment where landslide dam, the water backs up behind some of the material which has fallen into the river, backs up behind that and then there's a sudden release of very fast flow of sediment laden water. In addition to the earthquake risk, Earthquake risk, there's also a record in the geological um, sampling of historic liquefaction. Um, and so we know that Westport is, is vulnerable to liquefaction and as the sea level rises in the future, we can expect groundwater to rise, um, which will further increase the risk of liquefaction in the future. Okay, so now I'm just going to talk a little bit about the um, flood history of Westport. So we've actually got quite an extensive uh, record of floods um, in the history of the Westport town. And we've got written records at least from the earliest days of European settlement. Um, so there was a number of floods through the 1850s and 1860s. But the first really, really big flood um, which I found records was of is the flood of 1873. So this was a very large flood. Unfortunately, we don't have an estimate of the actual magnitude or the flow rate of that event. However, we do know it was very big. So it's, it's recorded as damaging or destroying much of the northern end of Westport. Um, reports state that the Stanley Wharf, the National Hotel, a large two-storey building and a store were all swept away by the river out to sea. So a lot of power behind the water there, sweeping two-storey buildings out to sea. Um, the river's reported to have changed course um, cutting a new channel through the North Spit, uh, therefore becoming an island. Um, and just other interesting notes, a slaughterhouse, piggery, a skin yard, and tools on the spit were completely washed away. 
So just to, to go through um, a little bit of background as to put things into context, it's really interesting, some people may not be aware how much Westport has changed um, since the 1800s. So, so we found this map um, from 1878, um, and the map is a historic document, but it's been really accurately drawn. So we've scanned this into the computer and overlaid it onto existing maps and aerial imagery, and we find that it aligns very well. So, so hats off to, to the surveys back in, 18, in the 1870s for doing such highly detailed and accurate work. So just the key thing to point out here for the town of Westport, was the coastline was in a completely different place to what it is today. So if we look at this map, I'm just going to now make it a little bit transparent and put it over the, over the aerial, current aerial imagery. And what we can see was that the mouth of the Orowaiti was where the Snodgrass area is today, and the mouth of the Buller is where the, um, the wetland Lagoon Estuary area is, with the coastline being about a kilometre and a half um, further south than it is right now. And so now we just move on just to, just to see a clear image of, of Westport as it is today. Um, so this image here just simply highlights we've traced on the location of the coastline from the 1860s as well as the 1880s. And we can just see that it's a, it's a completely different town. And this shoreline bulge here, which I've just highlighted in, in brown, is all built up um, land, which is built up artificially due to the construction of, of the breakwaters for the construction of the port in the, in the 1880s and 1890s. And I'm going to go into that in a little, a little bit more detail um, later on in this presentation. So a couple of other things to highlight is just how much the river has changed. So this is up at the Organs Island in the overflow area. So I just wanted to highlight that the original alignment of the river um, didn't go straight out of the gorge as it does now. It actually cut out on a bit of a bit of a dog leg, what we call an oxbow. Um, and so, if we overlay this map here onto the aerial imagery, we can just see that the river's actually been diverted um, on a straight path. And so, just showing you the clear imagery here. Um, so, just a little bit more about that. That was actually uh, engineered engineered realignment of the river, which they called the relief channel. It occurred in the 1880s after the 1870 flood. Um, and what we can see is, so the red line which I've drawn here is the original path of the river and the yellow line, um, the yellow line here just simply shows how the river has been straightened. So that was just artificially straightened. All they did was, was use some excavators, cut a channel through. Um, they didn't cut out the whole river and they just allowed the river to naturally scour itself out over years. And the purpose of this realignment was to try and prevent the Orowaiti, which was slowly moving um, towards, sorry, the Buller River was slowly diverting itself towards the Orowaiti and there was a concern that 100% of the Buller River flow may start um, flowing down the Orowaiti which would put the town at significant risk. Um, and just interesting, um, just to point out some historical documents which, um, which talk about the origins of the relief channel. This is a, um, a document by the Westport Harbour Works um, from 1891 and was written by Napier Bell and so there's just some small text here just pointing out. So he said, I think that the floods will continue to deepen and widen this channel until in the course of years the greatest body of water will flow down it. This is what we wanted as the more that passes down the relief channel, the less overflows at the Orowaiti. So it's just really interesting to see how, um, how the environment has changed. Some of it man-made, some of it natural. Interesting, um, we, we snip it from that same document, just at the end of that document, they have a table um, which is detailing the income and expenditure from 1884 to 1891. So just a couple of interesting things to point out here. Large sums of money which were being spent back in the 1880s. So all I've done, I'm not an economist myself, but I've gone online and I've found an online converter which converts um, the value of the pound back in the 1890s to present day value. And we can see that between 1884 and 1891, they've recorded they've spent more than 2.3 million New Zealand dollars um, in dredging. And the overall construction costs of that entire um, port area with the breakwaters, the dredging, the Orowati overflow, all of that um, has come out at over $101 million. So quite significant sums in the present day value. So I'm gonna move on now to talk a little bit about the 1926 flood. Um, so the 1926 flood was actually the largest flood um, in New Zealand history. The Buller River broke its banks and flooded virtually the whole town. 
um, with hundreds of people rendered temporarily homeless. Um, and it's interesting to note that, re that the report state the northern end of town was where the damage was worst. Now that makes sense, and as we know with the flood mechanism, as we've learned in the most recent flood, that a lot of the flooding actually comes from the Orowaiti. Um, and that, that fits in with all of the large floods actually, with the worst damage being in the northern end of town. So re newspaper reports um, do state that people lost all of their belongings, um, and the flooding was so bad that people had to be actually rescued off their roofs um, in, in boats. So pretty severe flooding in 1926. There was a number of floods between 1926 and 1970, however, none of them um, were anywhere near as bad as the 1970 flood. There was quite a large flow in 1950, uh, but I won't go into too much detail about that. But in 1970, um, it's recorded as being the worst flooding since 1926. That's until our most recent flood, that is. Um, so it's quite interesting to note that at Hawke's Crag, um, the 1970 flood was actually three metres lower than the flood of 1926. So why is it was a bad flood? There was actually a lot less water than we had in 1926. Um, so placing a return period to that, it's somewhere between a 30 and a 40 year event. Um, the State Highway Bridge was badly damaged. Two of the piers were actually um, damaged due to a build-up of, of debris, so quite large um, native timber logs jammed up behind the piers and broke them. Um, so that bridge was replaced not long after the 1970 flood. Again, pointing out that the flood levels, floor levels were flooded in the northern end of town, um, and media reports state that the Orowaiti overflow actually saved much of the town. So we've just got some photos here um, highlighting the extent of flooding. So as you can see, it's quite bad flooding going through several, several floor levels and the streets were, were inaccessible to vehicles. So another thing which I just want to highlight, really interesting to point out, I mentioned earlier um, about the change in coastline. So if we just have a look here, here is an aerial image taken in 1974. So this was just a few years after the flood. This one's taken at low tide. Um, so you can see the exposed sand on the beach, but at high tide that would just be water. But what we can see is that the distance um, from the from the Orowaiti to the sea is only probably 100 metres or so. Um, but if we look at the aerial image of that area now, we can see that a very significant bulge of land has formed um, since the 1970s. All right, so I've just got a, a wee zoomed in section of that photo now, and it's just really interesting to see what we can see just at the at, in the Orowaiti there is just a little clearing in the vegetation. Now I'm not too sure, I don't have access to records um, saying what this was for, but it appears to have been opened up manually, quite likely during the flood event. I can imagine some people were trying to just allow the overflow, the Orowaiti to overflow into the sea more directly um, to reduce the pressure on flooding. And just highlighting here with the red arrow, the, the path that water would have taken, and it's just really interesting to compare that um, with the current imagery showing that, well, in 1970 it only had about 100 metres to get to the sea if you did a cut, but now it would have to go 1.5 kilometres, so that growing coastline is definitely exacerbating the flood risk of Westport. Um, so in addition to river flooding, as I mentioned earlier, Westport's also exposed to coastal flooding, and we experienced that in February 2018 with Cyclone Fahey. So what I've got on the screen here, I don't have good aerial imagery from that event. Well, I have some, but not much of the entire extent, but here's just a, a, a computer representation of what we think the flood extent was. And those blue dots are, are measured um, survey points of, of the maximum water extent. And here's just an image, um, helicopter image showing the flood extent through Snodgrass area. So just to point out, this image wasn't taken at the peak um, of the flood. And so the extent of flooding was actually worse than was shown in that image. So in summary, um, we can say that Westport has been really badly flooded on, on many occasions over the last century, or well, even over the last 150 years. Flooding has been so severe that it's washed away buildings and structures. Um, the floods have caused homelessness and as I've highlighted a couple of times, that slowly growing coastline is exacerbating the flood risk from the Orowaiti. And there's no reason as to why this won't happen again tomorrow. So it happened in July 2021. Hopefully we have a decent break, but with the weather gods, we never know what's going to happen. So we, we should be prepared and expect that a flood could happen any week.